Will your anchor hold in the storm of life? When the clouds unfold, their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? together. 
good work in you. We'll bring it to completion, yes? Okay. He who began a good work Jesus' blood and righteousness. We're just going to share this song with you this morning, Cornerstone. Trust 
the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging a bit welcome. So when I say happy Sabbath, I want you to say Maranatha. Happy Sabbath, everybody. No, say Maranatha. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Maranatha means Jesus is soon coming soon. Well, Jesus is coming soon. I am under strict orders not to keep here for too long. I remember speaking to, to someone during the week and saying the first time I had the privilege to stand here was when I was a teenager and I was asked to, to preach, sorry, to um, pray. And my legs, the first time in my life, and, and since then, that my legs wobbled underneath me. And I wondered would the same thing happen with four steps walking here. And praise be, it hasn't happened yet. 
Let's get straight into the text. The text is taken from Acts 7, 59 and 60. And it says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come before you today. As always, we want to thank you for bringing us together here, together, and both in the building and those online as well. I pray that you take charge of this message and may it resonate in my heart and resonate in the hearts of those who listen as well. And may we get a different vantage point on what our trials mean. And above all, may we understand two things, that we have a purpose and there is hope. These things I pray to the authority of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Of course, sometimes in terms of my relationship with God, in terms of speaking, he will come to me at the last minute. So I was told about this sermon a long time ago, and I, I wasn't still sure in terms of what I was going to speak about today, although I've been writing it for the last uh, a few months. And then last week, we had heard in Sabbath school, um, we were talking about the different trials. And Pastor coincidentally talked about Stephen. And I knew that I had to preach this sermon today. And I still wasn't sure about the introduction. So I've asked John to have a couple of pictures for me. So I've just decided at this moment if we can have that picture up there. So I don't know how to preach a sermon or share God's gospel without being personal. So a few months ago, some of you may know, my uncle passed away. So my family had all decided we were going to fly back and be together. For the first time in a long time, everybody was going to be together. Before that happened, the head of the family, my uncle, passed away. So our joy quickly turned into mourning. And so when this was happening, we were all trying to get back, and we had all these different obstacles, different trials. Do you have the second picture, John? And so my auntie was trying to get a flight to reach... Uh, my grandmother's place where the, where the funeral was to take place and she was caught up in an accident so bad that she had to crawl out of the back and she said when she crawled out and, and someone pinched her that's when she knew she was alive she thought she had died and different things happened on that trip and different things happened in people's lives and for me at that moment when they were sinking my uncle in I could see my mother wailing my uncle, who, who's, who's the baby of the family, but in his 40s, a father of three, he became the baby again. And my sister nearly broke down. And Dorothy used to come here. She was in tears because she couldn't bear the fact that her father was being plunged into the ground. It was also the same time where we had a death in the church that knocked us back. And I looked at this and said, these are trials. I don't understand why. And for the first time in my life, I asked God, why is this happening? I am not an emotional man, you can ask my family. But as we stood around and prayed, I was breaking down into tears because I could not understand why this was happening. And this isn't personal to me, this happens with many of you, with the different struggles that you go through. And the interesting thing is that you come here every Sabbath still believing, despite your trials and your tribulations, and things that occur. And I wanted to look at this, I was drawn to the story of Stephen, and I couldn't understand why initially. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, we know Stephen, right? What do we know about Stephen? Typically, Stephen was what? Stoned to death, persecuted. He was the first Christian martyr, someone who believed in so, uh, principles so vehemently that he was willing to die for it. But there's even so much more in Stephen's story. There are two running themes in this. Number one, purpose. And number two, hope. You have to indulge me a bit. I'm a huge fan of politics. And I love American politics. Even the razzmatazz that goes on today with Trump. One of my favorite politicians is Bill Clinton. And if you know his story, how he, he eventually became president, he went through trials and obstacles. And people told him, you couldn't do it. And he was born in a, in a town called Hope. And eventually, when he became nominated for president, he gave a speech. He was called the comeback kid. 
And at the end of the speech, he said, I still believe in a place called hope. And so when I faced that situation back home, I asked myself the question, do I still believe in a place called hope? And so we look at Stephen's story. Let me introduce you to Stephen. So Stephen the man. So Stephen was one of the great men of faith in the early churches. Though he was not an apostle, he holds a special place in scripture because he was chosen to minister to the widows who were being cared for in Jerusalem. He, along with six other men, were full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And we eventually know what happened to Stephen. Now, one of my favorite speakers always says, put your, 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 your Bibles or your scripture up or your tablets for those who've come here armed and dangerous. So I'm gonna ask you the same thing. Who's come here armed and dangerous? Where are your Bibles? It's 2017, wave those phones and those tablets in the air. If you've come here armed and dangerous, we're going to go through this, the, the Bible. And I'm going to walk you through Stephen's story, step after step. So we see with Stephen, he goes on and, and the Bible says he's, he's doing everything. He is preaching, he is reasoning with people, he is caring for those in need. He is the very definition of a Christian. And then what happens? There's a trial awaiting in the corner. His fellow brothers and sisters, those who claim to believe as well, have set up a plan for him to fall. See, the interesting thing with Stephen's story is that the, the devil designed a plan, not externally, but it was internal. It was to come from within. And how it relates to us is sometimes the devil designs a, a plan for our destruction to come from within. And it's not just from our brothers and sisters. It can be things like our vices, alcohol, sex, or addicted to porn. Different things that can bring us down, the devil would design to destroy our relationship with God. Acts 6 says, Stephen stood out among the believers and he did great things, great wonders and signs among the people. And so we then see Stephen being accused. He's brought before these men who can make life or death decisions. Who's, who's ever been in court? Don't put up your hands if there's the wrong reason. So I, I went when I was a paralegal. I, I'd gone into a criminal court. And you can see these guys in, in longer gowns than I'm, at, I'm in. Incredibly intimidating. So I was working with this young boy who had been wrongfully accused of, of using a bottle and smashing over someone's head. And he was about 18 or so. So he could have been sent to jail for a long time. So it was his time to then give his witness statement. So he was put in the witness box, but beforehand he was shaking. He was panicking because these, this was a life or death decision. And so I'm telling him, dude, you need to calm down because you can't lose it. You need to be as calm as possible. But I can't understand why he was panicking. And so he stands in a witness box. And then one of the barrister comes forward, long gown, with his glasses. He does a brother Clark, tips it. And he's about to speak. And before he says anything, the boy just breaks down in tears. He's crying. And I can understand why. That was his life in someone else's hands. So we see in Acts that they, they ask Stephen, are these charges true in 7, 1 and 2? And you know how Stephen responds? Stephen says, brothers and sisters, listen to me. And, and Ellen White says he says so in the clearest and calmest voice. The interesting thing is if some of us are accused of wrongdoing by our brothers and sisters, what do we tend to do? We scream, we retort in anger, or we just stop speaking to them. And then we hold AYS programs about love, agape love, and we've got to love each other better. But I ask, how does Stephen get so connected that his response was so calm and so clear? Do you know the amazing thing with Stephen's story? He then proceeds to give the second longest sermon in scripture, but he does three things in the sermon. Stephen preaches, Stephen teaches, 
and then Stephen testifies. Let me break it down for you. The only way he can preach is if he's read the gospel. The only way we can then preach to other people is if we read ourselves. So where are the young people in the house? The Bible says what? Study to show yourself. But in 2017, I don't think that text just applies to young people anymore. It also applies to their parents and to the adults. Can I keep it real with you? How on earth are they supposed to teach or preach a gospel if their parents aren't reading it to them? How are they supposed to preach a gospel if their parents aren't reading it at all? There's a study in in, um, the Telegraph report. It says that over the last 20 to 30 years, there's a, there's a 46% of kids are now being read um, uh, biblical stories in comparison to 80% of kids in their parents' times. Where's our children's leader? Craig, these are BRICS kids, right? They're saying that half of them are now hearing less and less of, of biblical stories on a day-to-day basis in comparison to their parents. And yet we ask the question, Eleanor, where do you then? So after Stephen preaches, he does the second thing. He begins to teach. The thing about this church, and some people ask, what differentiates you? The one thing that I do know that we do is we tie in history with biblical teachings. We are called not to be monks, as Ellen White said, inside this church, but to understand what goes on in history and what goes on in our present. And do you know what that makes us? It makes us activists, people with a voice. Thirdly, Stephen begins to testify. This is my favorite part. See, we we get it twisted, we read it, and, and his response, he is talking about what they're accusing him about in terms of the temple. But Stephen begins to talk about people who preceded him. So he talks about Abraham, talks about Moses, Jacob, and Joseph. Do you know what he's doing? He is telling them of a journey from the beginning to where he is now. But what I've come to realize is some of us have that same story, but we are so concerned with people seeing our now that we don't want them to know what's happened in our past. We are so concerned with people seeing where we are now that we don't want them to know how we got here. And so what do we do? We start to witness by information. Anything but our story. But the Bible says we're not called to witness by information. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by what? The word of their testimony. But we do anything but to tell our story. I remember meeting someone, and she was reading a book on a train. So I, 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 it's, um, it was a book that I was interested in, so I'd ask her where she got it. And then, funny enough, she turned out to be a Christian. And she invited me to a Bible study uh, just in um, Starbucks. So I said, I'll come one day. So I came, and this guy was taking it. And so he sat down with me, and I was like, I'm really interested. I don't really get a chance to do this too much uh, with, with people my age, right? And the, what do you think the first thing he started to do, to do when, it, when I said I was an Adventist? Started to ask me about Sabbath. I was like, bro, like, I, I get that, but I just want to like, reason with you. I want to share my story. I want to know your story as well. We can get to that. But what I fundamentally see is that we will do anything but to tell our story. And Stephen does a fourth thing here. He adds a fourth bow to his string. Stephen begins to praise. Now, can you imagine... In his trial, he begins to praise. So in Acts 7, it says, he begins to say, Look, 756 to 57, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And do you know what the response was when he was saying that? 
So Ellen White then says, in the cruel faces of, of, of the prisoners, so of the cruel faces about him, the prisoner read his fate, but he did not waver. For him, the fear of death was gone. For him, the enraged priests and the excited mob had no terror. Their responses, they covered their ears when he said, I see the right hand of God, the, the, the Son of Man at the right hand of God. They covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed him. See, what I've understood is that in the midst of your trial, you sometimes, no, no, you always have to give praise. There are times when you praise to spite the devil, because that's the reaction. There are times when you praise in spite of physical ailments, in spite of your pain, in spite of poverty, in spite of bad news, and remind yourself that trouble don't last always. You have to remind yourself you serve a God whose ears are not too heavy to hear and whose arms are not too short to save. Isaiah says in, in, in Isaiah, sing you barren women, even those who have never bore a child, burst in song and shout for joy, even when you know when never been in labor, for the children of the desolate woman will be more than children, will be more than the children of that that is married. He's saying here that praise when you are at a disadvantage. Praise when all hell is breaking loose. Praise when you get bad news and when the enemy wants you to drop your head. Praise when the good times are here, but you better make sure you praise when the bad times are here as well. Because guess what? The enemy hates it. But more importantly, God deserves it. Now here's an interesting part in the story. In Acts 7, 58, they'd cast him out of the city and stoned him. It almost does it a disservice by saying stoned him. The Common English Bible says they battered him with stones. Can you imagine? It says, as they do this, this is the next thing that they do that blew my mind in this story. They proceed to take off their outer garment the witnesses proceed to take off the outer garment and put it on the floor. Does that not scream weird to you? In the midst of a persecution, of a stoning of death, they proceed to take the outer garments and lay it on the floor. I couldn't understand it. And in the, in the context of the story, it was just oddly placed. So I had to do some research on this. So there are different thought processes in, in terms of why this happened. Now, historically, what they said is, the, uh, for instance, with a male victim, when a condemned man was at a distance of four cubits and they, were, they uh, were about to stone him, they stripped him of his garments. That's a possible reason. But I see three, three reasons in and around this, because Stephen wasn't in the wrong, so number one, who remember as a kid when, when, when in, in secondary school, when we see all these little fights happening, right, and people take off what? Taken, they're ready for action, right? That could have been one reason. Two, if we go back to that explanation, it was a spiritual reason, because the condemned person used to be stripped, but this time it was the condemners who were doing the stripping. So the... the Condemnation had transferred from Stephen to the people who were stoning him. But can I make it a simpler reason? They simply didn't want to be stained by his blood. This is the most expensive part of my outfit, not the inside. They didn't want the stain of Stephen's blood on them. And secondly, this is the most harrowing part of this story. They had become so numb to suffering that they were more concerned about their outer appearance. Some of you will catch this soon. They had become so numb about theological debates that they had become numb to someone else's suffering, to their own brother suffering right in front of them. And I asked myself, have I become so numb that I keep quiet at the persecution of others. Because the Bible tells us 
that we too one day will be persecuted. And when we start looking around, like who's going to have our back? And no one's there. And then we wonder because we've been silent during persecutions. Have we too taken our cloaks off at the persecution of others? Have we become so numb with seeing all these things happening day after day? Service and sacrifice. So coming towards the end, as Stephen's been stoned, he looks up calling upon God and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And as they continue to batter him with stones, he kneels down and cries with, cries with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Now, I couldn't understand this. So hold on. So he's been accused by his own brothers and sisters. They have taken stones and they have battered him with it. And at the point of death, he is still concerned about other people. He said, take, take me, Lord. But his last thing to say is what? Lay not the sin on their charge. It's incredible. So I ask, how, how on earth can someone think like this at this moment in time, through their trials, to think of other people? Do you know the interesting part in the Bible? I think Stephen knew something that we, most of us might not know, or certainly I didn't. Stephen knew his purpose. We get it twisted and think Stephen's purpose was to be a martyr. Stephen's purpose was to affect those around him. Can I prove it to you? If you go to Acts 6, when we first introduce to Stephen, before Stephen is talked about, about having uh, performing miracles with theological knowledges, Stephen is introduced to us by his purpose, and that was to service who? The widows. So Stephen knew that there was something greater than death, which is a failure to live life with a purpose. And so at that point, that's how we could give his testimony. And that's how we could look at other people and be concerned for them at the point of death. Purpose. But the story ends. It's wholeheartedly disappointing for me. It's like going to a movie, right, and the hero of the movie dies at the end. You feel cheated. But what happened? Chapter 7 literally ends with Stephen falls asleep, full stop. Right? It's like, it's weird. How can the story end like that? This is the most incredible thing. Here's how the Bible is structured. Do you know how verse 8 begins? Do you know how verse 8 begins? Verse 8 begins, sorry, chapter 8, sorry. Chapter 8 begins with, and Saul. Some of you would get that if you know who Saul is, or who Saul became. Chapter 8 begins with, and Saul. Saul will later become who? Who would become one of the forefathers and foundations of our faith. So check this out. So, in, in, do we have the teachers in the building? Where's Paul? So, in English, we're taught, right? You don't really begin a new sentence with and, and certainly not a new chapter, right? So, I had to, I had to go back and look at this and, and see what it was. So, it's called a coordinating conjunction, which coordinating conjunctions join part of a sentence. The purpose is a transitional word. There are seven different types of coordinated conjunctions. But, for, nor, or, so, yet, and. So this is what it means. Listen to what Ellen White says. The death of Stephen was a sore trial to the church. This is Acts of the Apostles, page 103, 101, if you want to read it. His death was a sore trial to the church, but it resulted in the conviction of Saul. 
She then says in Acts of the Apostles 102, for a time he was a mighty instrument in the hands of Satan to carry out the rebellion against the Son of God. But soon this relentless persecutor was to be employed in the building up of the church that he was tearing down. A mightier than Satan had chosen Saul to take the place of the martyr Stephen, to preach and, and to suffer for his name, and to spread far and wide the tidings of salvation through. If you don't get it, when the enemy had tried to put an end to Stephen's story by putting him through the ultimate trial and taking his life, and he thought he ended it, God literally begins a new chapter. And if you still don't get it, so what this means for you is when he put a full stop to Stephen's story and he thought he put an end to it, he forgot he was messing with the beginning and the end. And when he thought he could shake your faith, he's forgetting he's, he's messing with the author and the finisher of your faith. And when he thought he could put your education to an end, he's simply messing with El Shaddai, God Almighty. When he thinks he can empty out your bank account, you have nothing else to eat when you go back home. He's messing with Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Don't you get it twisted when he thinks he's making you ill and that sickness has ravaged your body and there seems to be no cure. He's messing with Jehovah Sharma, your healer. Oh, and when he thinks he can make you feel alone and there's no one else around you, you're the only person suffering. He is messing with Jehovah Sharma, God is with us. And if you still don't get it, that very same thing that the devil used as an instrument to affect Stephen's life, and he attempts to make as an instrument to affect your life, whether it's that illness, whether it's no jobs, where you have no papers, where it's that a boyfriend, that a girlfriend, that husband that seems to be drawing you away from God, God will begin a new chapter in your life. And if you still don't get it, when that illness seems to have no cure, there will be an and sore. When that career isn't where you want it to be, there will be an and sore. When your count is dried up, there will be an and sore. When you go home today and there's nothing, no common banana for you to eat, there will be an and sore. When your kids who you struggle to bring up in the faith have left, there will be an and sore. When your sexual desires and your struggles seem to have taken over you, there will be a what? An and sore. When your marriage is on the precipice of breaking down, there will be an and sore. And when you feel like your life isn't where you want it to be, there will be an and sore. For this same Saul, who used to tear down the church, was used to build it up. This same Saul would say this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day. We are counted for sheep for slaughter. Nay, in all these things I say we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor other creatures shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is Jesus in you. I am standing here to tell you, you will go through your trials, and they will shake your, the cause of your faith. And here's the thing, Saul's conviction didn't come immediately. And Stephen died before we could see the continuation of his work. And here's a sober reminder. You might not live to see the fruits of your labor. Service comes with sacrifice. You might not live to see the fruits of your labor. But I'm standing here to tell you that your service matters. Your life matters. And there is hope in the face of your accusers. There is hope in the face of suffering. There's hope even in death. And there will always be an and soul. And if you take nothing away from this, I hope you take this. Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this very thing that he who begun a good work in you will perform it until the very end of the day of Jesus Christ. So my appeal is not for you to stand up. We were all going through our trials. But I do want us to pray on two things. That we will live out our purpose 
and we continue to hold out for that hope. It's challenging being, and people say it's easy being a Christian. It is, you're resting on Christ. But let's be real. It's hard, man. It takes everything. My mom says all the time, it takes everything to serve God. But it's worth it. Because your circumstances change, but he doesn't. So I just want us to pray that we all will leave here still believing in a place called hope. Let us pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you today. I just want to thank you for the message that you've given me, and I hope that people have been touched with as well. We are going through our various difficulties, but we continue to trust in you, and we see through the, the amazing way your word is built up and, and put together, that though we may be going through our various trials, there will always be a continuation of our story. When the enemy tries to put a full stop in our story, you begin as simply a new chapter. We thank you for purpose. May each and every single one of us live it out. And we thank you for hope. Hope in the face of our trials and our tribulations. These things I pray to the authority of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We want to thank God for a place called home, right? And I'm hoping that everyone is encouraged by the message. Can we stand and sing our closing song, which is 516? 516.
was uh, to our various destinations. As we're about to make our way to our various destinations, Lord, we just want to thank you for, our, for the God that you are and for the trials and tribulations that we will go through. You've led us all the way. May that be our song when we soon meet with you and you tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. May we be reminded that you've started a good work in us and you'll be faithful to complete it until the end. These things I pray to the authority of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Will be faithful to complete it. 